Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It's a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. It's one 450 6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour. It's another episode of the Ask Noah Show t- takes off. This is uh, going to be a little bit more relaxed of an episode. Uh, as the eagle eye among you, you may have noticed I am not in my usual uh, digs tonight. I am out with my family, and um, so I have scored some studio space to, uh, to do the show, because of course we don't miss the show. The show always comes first Tuesday, Tuesday nights, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm always here with you. But um, just a little bit more relaxed, I guess, because I, I haven't spent um, the entire day um, only thinking about the show, which is my usual Tuesday routine. But happy to be here with you. As always, your calls go to the front of the line, one 450 noah 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Now, coming up in the program, just because it's a little bit more relaxed of a feel does not mean we don't have a full show lined up for you tonight, because I assure you that we do. Coming up, we are going to talk about your ability to host your own email service. How you can host a true Gmail competitor by just ordering a box and plugging it in at your house. That has become a reality this week. We're going to discuss that coming up later in the hour. Simon Quigley this hour fills in as call screener. He's going to join us later in the program and talk about the newest release of QT 5.9.7. So that's coming up. And finally, we are going to get into a little bit more code of conduct stuff because I didn't didn't get myself in enough trouble with all of the folks on the internet last time. Turns out that SQLite has uh, written a very interesting code of conduct. I'll just leave it at that. We're going to dive into all of that. And then somewhere throughout the show, we are also going to tell you about some of the really cool changes that are coming up on the Ask Noah show because... It seems like a waste to me that we have all of this streaming infrastructure, all of this broadcasting equipment, and we only use it basically twice a week. I do the Ask Noah show on Tuesday nights, and then, of course, our friend Brad Schmidt does the Schmidt show from our studios. But other than that, we, we, don't, we don't use this equipment very often, and uh, at least not often enough. And what I'm finding is that there is a lot of content that we're not able to cover because we can't fit it into a one hour radio show. And so the question that I have posed to all of the people that work on the Ask Noah Show team is, what can we do about that? How can we change? How can we grow so that we're covering more of that content? And the answer seems to be, well, one, bring on another producer. So we did that. But then the second change seems to be, we need to do more of the show. And so we're looking at ways to do that. Again, one 450 no it's 855-450-6624, the email live at asknoahshow.com. One of the things that we're going to have to do a little bit differently is I think the way to make that work is to, obviously, we're going to keep Tuesday nights. We're going to keep all of the calls coming in because you need a time and a place that you know you can show up and ask your questions. And we've been able to provide that for you for a year running. We've never missed a beat. Every Tuesday, started out on Mondays, we moved it to Tuesdays, but every at least once a week, at roughly the same time, at roughly the same day, we have always taken your call. So if you know you have a Linux question and you want to know where you can go to ask it, you know where that is. And we put those calls to the front of the line. I think the way to pivot from that or the way to add to that, so to speak, is to start doing special segments where we bring on guests and we interview them and we talk to them. We pick their brains about what they care about, what they know about, and allow them to share their knowledge with us and... Obviously, we'll have the phone lines open, but it won't necessarily be the focus. It won't necessarily be required for a good show because right now, if we don't have a lot of calls, the show kind of drags because my voice is pretty monotonous and we can plan around that. Or at least I think we can. Or at least we're going to try. 
And um, that actually is going to start later this week because we have a couple of special episodes lined up. And those episodes we're going to take and um, we're going to we're going to fit. We're going to do a couple of those at the end of this week, a couple of those next week. And we're going to try and fit some of that content that we're not ordinarily able to cover. One of the most simplest examples of which I was in North Carolina out in Red Hat country. And there was a gentleman who built a tiny home uh, with a lot of Linux hardware and a lot of really cool networking stuff. And that didn't make it into the show. Well, we went out there, we filmed a bunch of stuff, we talked to the guy, but it didn't make it into the show. And part of that is just because we run out of time each week. So we're going to try and fix that. But as always, your calls go to the front of the line. Jay calls from Utah. Hey, Jay, thanks for hanging in there with me. Uh, just uh, while I rambled a little bit. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, thanks for uh, letting me on. I yeah, you bet, man. I wanted to say uh, first-time caller, long-time listener, even though I haven't been on too long. So. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate I just, uh, it. I wanted to get your advice. Uh, one of the one one cool thing about your show is that you started a business with Linux, and uh, I just wanted to get your advice on what you think would be good for someone that wanted to kind of start something small on the side using Linux and helping people. Just kind of some advice on what would what be, what would be a good small business for somebody. Sure. Are you talking about a technical, like a technical service business, kind of like Speed Technologies, or are you asking just in general what's a good small business to get into? Well, yeah, technical, something that, yeah, like like Altispeed. Gotcha. Well, the first thing I tell anybody that is interested in starting a small business is do it debt free because debt adds risk to a business. And small business is already littered with with risk. So you want to be as risk averse as possible. That would be the first advice I would give to anybody. Yeah. And the way that we get there, Jay, is that we start with something like doing our day job and doing some IT stuff or some technical stuff on the side. We do that in our free time. Maybe we do it at nights or maybe we do it on the weekends. Maybe we do it on holidays. And we slowly grow that up to the point where we start, we look over and we want to be making as, at least as much in our small business, preferably a little bit more than we're making in our day job. And the reason for that is because you want to, I, the, the analogy that I've, I'm stealing it from somebody else, but the analogy is you take a boat that's in a lake. And if you want to jump from the dock to the boat, the goal is to get the boat as close to the dock as possible so that when we jump, there's very little risk of us landing in the water. Because I've known many small business owners that want to start a small business. They have the passion. They have the knowledge. They have the work ethic. But they didn't get the boat close enough to the dock. And so they quit their day job. They quit the, you know, the, 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 the old adage of a bird in the hand for the two in the bush. And they get there maybe, or maybe they don't, but a lot of times they get wet in the process, Jay. And, and I actually, I am a bad example of that. I quit my job uh, about three months before I actually started Alta Speed Technologies. I had zero income for like seven months, eight months. It was horrible. I wouldn't recommend anybody do that. And then on top of that, because life just likes to, I don't know, play with me, I found out four months into the six months without income that my wife was pregnant and we were going to have our first child. So I brought my first child into this world without any way to feed myself, much less him. I mean, that's how stupid I was. And it worked out for me. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it. So so my, my first advice is stay away from debt. My second advice is try to build it up on the side if you can until you don't have to uh, uh, so you don't have to that far to jump. The third thing I would tell you is as far as like day to day, practically speaking, what to do kind of stuff, I would look at if you're doing technical stuff, make friends with small business owners, go into small business. It can be the cafe that you eat at. It can be the coffee shop that you're at and just talk to the owner or talk to those that are in charge and just say, Hey, I noticed you have this problem with that POS, or I noticed you have this problem point of sale system. I noticed you have this problem with that uh, Wi-Fi. Um, could I help you with that? I have a small business and I've got some, you know, you print up some little cards and you say, I, I can help you with that. And what you'll find is opportunity is all around you. You just have to be prepared to meet it. And so, uh, and I'll give you a perfect example of that. Um, I was in a restaurant and the restaurant did not have Wi-Fi. And I asked, I said, do you guys have Wi-Fi? No, we don't. And I, I went back to them and I said, okay. And I just handed them my card and I said, you know, if you're interested in Wi-Fi, give me a call. And it was really more of a, more of a way to tell them that, 
I work in IT, and so if I don't have Wi-Fi, I'm not going to eat here. To be honest with you, it really wasn't much of a sales pitch. But the owner called me a couple days later, and he said, yeah, you know, actually, I was thinking about it. I would do Wi-Fi, and I went to your website, and I, you guys also do security cameras, and you also do um, uh, what we call, you know, entertainment systems. So we put in, like, amplifiers and play music into our outdoors. Would you come back and do that? And, uh, and so we did. we did. We did the whole kit and caboodle. We did their network. We did Wi-Fi, the whole nine yards. Um, and I got that job just because I just because I asked for it, just because I handed out a card. The other thing you can do, Jay, be available and answer the phone. Because I'm trying to get some landscaping done in my backyard, or at least tried to, the past couple of months. And I cannot, for the life of me, get a landscaper to call me back. And I've left messages. I've sent emails. I've contacted people on Facebook. Every landscape company... Uh, out there, I have laid out what I want them to do. I can't even get them to call me back, much less actually show up. And it's very frustrating as a customer to not even have somebody call me back. The first guy to call me back would probably get the job just by default. And um, and you see that happen in the IT industry as well. A lot of people know that there's a joke between our former video editor, Rikai, and myself that he really likes Five Guys. True story, about four months ago, five months ago, we got a call from the local Five Guys. And they said, we've been trying to contact our network service provider. We can't get a hold of them. Our network doesn't work. We can't sell burgers. Can you help us? I said, absolutely. So I came over there and we, we got the problem solved for them. We got that client, ended up selling them Wi-Fi and a couple other things. But the, we got that client, again, because I answered the phone. So common sense stuff. And it might seem like, well, obviously, I would carry business cards. Obviously, I would answer the phone. Obviously, when I see a problem, I would point it out. But those are the kind of things that you'd be surprised how many people overlook. And like I said, opportunity is all around. Does that kind of help you? Does that get you started? Yeah, I, I think so. Because when I think of, you know, what you know, what should I do for the business or something, I just, I think, you know, well, what, what do people need? I think you answered that, and that is to, to just meet more people, meet more small business owners and things like that. <clears throat> and those opportunities will come. So, yeah, I think, I think that was a good key. So, yeah. Outstanding. Well, thank you very much for your call, Jay. And yeah, and keep your eye open. Keep your eye open and pay attention to the world around you. I think uh, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how far that takes you. Just paying attention to what is around you. And, and like you said, there's there's an old saying, if you help enough people in life get what they want, they'll help you get whatever you want in life. That's where I, that's really where I feel like I have wound up is I'm just I'm always the guy that's willing to solve the problem, sometimes to the point of the irritation to those around me. They're like, I don't need that problem solved. I don't need you to troubleshoot. I just need you to beat Noah. But I'm the guy that solves problems. And because of that, people reward me with things they call dollars. David calls from Berlin, Germany. Hey, David, welcome to the Ask Noah show. Oops. Uh, let's see here. How do we take? Uh, there we go. Uh, do, 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 okay, I'm gonna click this button. Sorry about that. Hey, David. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. No worries. Uh, thanks for taking my call. First of all, I'm a big fan of the show and the networks. And uh, first of all, thanks that for the work that you put in uh, into it. Um, so I have a rather theoretical questions about backups um, and not mm -hmm. a technical one. So I remember that uh, because of personal experience, you are usually prepped for a lot of things happening in life. You have, you talked about your go back, etc. cetera. Um, and um, a lead up question. So at home, when you think about backups, what do you consider the highest value items that you have in the backups? Yeah, so um, I don't know how in how much detail I want to get into that exact question, but I will tell you that there is data that I have that I want to preserve at all costs. I, well, I, actually, I can give you a couple examples. So uh, pictures of my kids, um, pictures of my kids, and videos of my kids as you know as they're as they're growing up and stuff like that. Those kind of things are completely irreplaceable, and I will do whatever I can to back them up at all costs. Yeah, there you go. Gee. Exactly. And the backup is only a backup if you have a recovery process that works, right? Correct. Okay. So um, the theoretical question here is that we as geeks uh, like our tools and we can operate them, but um, let's consider a man on a bus scenario. So let's assume I cycle to work and I got hit by a truck. Is our infrastructure really set up to be operated by our in-laws at the efficiency that we're used to it? That's a great, man, what, that is a great question. What can we do about it in, 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 in 
terms of open source, is there? A, I don't expect a click and work scenario, but I want my wife to be able to access all the stuff that we accumulated over the years, even if I'm not accessible for a, a bigger period of time. I understand that you're calling in from Germany. Do you want to take this question on the air? Or would you prefer I, I we I, I let you go and I'll answer it off the air? It's, the answer is kind of long. That's why I ask. No, I'm. I'm up. Okay, sounds good. So uh, there, that's a great question, and, and one that I don't think a lot of people think about the answer to. My answer to you is this. I absolutely have backups that my wife is more or less trained on how to recover the data. The most important data that we have, the things like the pictures of our kids and, and so forth, exist on what I call an air-gapped mm-hmm. laptop. So it's uh, it's on a laptop with, with a large hard drive in it, and... Um, yeah. That machine is not capable of being connected to any network or the internet, and we store a lot of data on there. Now, obviously, my wife has the encryption decryption password to that machine, and she knows where we store it. It's uh-huh. not in the house. Um, so it, it serves as an off-site backup uh-huh. as well as an encrypted backup as well as something that, as you say, something that can be put back into production without my presence. Now, when it comes to yeah. ultra speed technologies, I, I, I'll just go. I'll, I'll just use your question as a way to uh, to give an example. I have a contingency plan for everything, uh-huh. up to and including our business, because when you take on a client, you give that client your word that you are going to be there for them and you're going to take care of them. And your as 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 cruel as this sounds, you cannot allow your death or demise to get in the way of that promise. And so uh, there is a contingency plan for every client we have. Um, either close friends of mine that have other IT businesses, colleagues that I don't particularly care for, but I know that they are competent in in that regard. And of course, our most valuable clients, people that I have a personal relationship with, those, uh, I, there's another IT company that, um, that we uh, that we trade off clients from time to time. And uh, he is well aware that if anything happens to me, if I get hit by a bus, as you say, um, he's going to take over those clients and he has access to all of our information so that at a moment's notice, we just flip a switch and, and my wife knows how to do that, as does as does a couple of the other people in the company. And there's a protocol that they will follow if Noah dies. We have all of that planned out. Um, so that one, so that the, the legacy of UltraSpeed Technologies lives on, but also so that I live up to the promise that I have of, to my clients. And I, I, that, so that my answer so to you is that is... good. I'm sorry, there does a bit of a delay. So your answer to the question is rather policy or tr- and training rather than tooling. Yeah, I, I, yes, exactly. That's that's a man. If you ever need, if you ever have a spare Tuesday and you want to fill in for me, uh, you speak way more succinctly than I do. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, yes, documentation, <laughs> documentation, and and and, and planning. Really, it solves this problem, uh-huh. uh, and it solves this problem very effectively. Uh, uh, more. More in that question since you mentioned it. So um, let's assume the offsite obviously is the is the is the most important one. So um, I don't obviously don't want to ask if if you keep your air gap one at home or not. But but with the air gap one, it, you have a rotation on the data, or or how do you make sure that the data is actually up to date? If you, I don't know, I'm not sure how often you take pictures, but I'm a photographer, so obviously that's oh, sure. going to be a, a problem with big amounts of data. Yeah, so a uh, couple of things there. Uh, yeah, I don't mind telling you that I do not keep that AirGap laptop at home. Um, it is in property I own, but it is not here at, at, at it's not it's not in Grand Forks, it's not at the house. Um, the, the second thing I will tell you is that I don't back everything up, right? Like if you're a photographer, you probably do a lot of work. Uh-huh. That is important to your clients, maybe, and that is important to a lot of people. But if those pictures were to get lost, it's not the end of the world. It's just, you know, you lost some pictures. Um, The kind of stuff that I put on that AirGap machine is stuff that in no way, shape, or form could ever, ever be replaced. And it is essential and important at at a sentimental level to a lot of people other than myself. So you assign, let's assume, levels to the importance of the data and then have a more strict um, backup policy for them. That's like pretty that. much exactly what I do. So the the all the data in the house is put on a FreeNAS machine, which obviously it's not really a backup strategy, but obviously ZFS has 
very high redundancy so that it doesn't go down in the first place. Aside from that, I have a backup server, which is essentially a duplicate of the FreeNAS server that's constantly in sync with the FreeNAS server. That would that will save me if just the FreeNAS server dies. Obviously, it won't save me from the, uh, you know, if I got some sort of a virus or a corruption or something like that. Obviously, that would replicate to all of the mach both the machines. Aside from that, I then use uh, I use just external hard drives and I categorize them. You know, I've got movies in one and TV shows in another, and you know, and so on and so forth. And those back up to external drives. And I would say I run those about once a month, provided I remember. And then finally, we've got the last, the last, uh, you know, which the most sensitive of sensitive, the most important of the important data that goes to that air get machine. Okay, so it's training. That's going to be a long conversation with my wife. Yeah, well, and you know, here's the thing: scripts go a long way, man. Scripts go a long, long way. Hey, open this, take That's this true. flash drive, plug it in, plug the hard drive in, and double click on this uh, on this file and answer the questions. It goes a long way. Okay. That's good. Okay, so when I'm replacing my Synology, um, I'm gonna call you again probably for some other advice as well. I look forward Thanks to it. For Thanks for the. Thanks for the call from Germany. one 450 noah that's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Take this other call here. Uh, you're on the air. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, it's Annie. I was going to ask about a KDE question, but I, I heard you talk about backups, and it reminded me of, of a question I had about backups. I've been doing air backups for, like, ever. So ever since I had, like, you know, cassette tapes, and I was pushing play and then programming... But you, you know, um, sure. then, but I, one thing I do, and I have external hard drives like you do. I have, like, you know, different ones for different things like you do. Um, but with the new uh, crypto lockers and other viruses and stuff, they, um, they, they sit and wait sometimes. So how long, so I have like a, a weekly one that I back up weekly. And I was thinking about I should do it monthly too in case I have like, some evil thing that gets on my my backups that they might wait for a while and so it's good to like have like a ever a six month one too on top of the monthly one just in case some evil crypto locker or something gets stuck in there and it's like hiding and waiting yeah that's a good or point you would, you would not you enough. would not believe how many people i get that tell me they say well i use linux so i'm immune to all the windows viruses okay fine that's you're right you're right if you are your your machine is probably immune to the vast majority of malware out there i will give you that my next question to you is do you ever have a windows machine on your network because if you do you're just as susceptible as everybody else just because you can control your machine just because you choose to store your files on a file server that's not susceptible to a lot of these you know malware or or crypto viruses does not mean that somebody with a with the a susceptible machine couldn't bring their machine onto your network and because those shares are exposed to the network couldn't infect your shares so I, I, I and I we've I've had that conversation with numerous people and I've said, listen, that just because you run a secure environment doesn't doesn't it doesn't excuse you from having backups. And that's to your point. You're absolutely right. My I here's what I would say to you. I would say this. I don't think that anything more than monthly backups are probably required. I think that monthly backups are probably more than sufficient. If you get hit by a crypto locker virus, you're probably going to know within 30 days. Um, the only reason I would have a six month backup or, or anything more again is if you have data that is so vital that you absolutely cannot replace and cannot afford the, like, I mean, it just, it's more valuable than life itself kind of stuff. If you have that, obviously I would have more than one offsite backup. And if you're going to have more than one offsite backup, then yeah, sure. Why not stay grim, put one monthly and maybe one bi-monthly or, or every six months. Okay. Can I ask? Yeah, you bet. Any question then, too? What's the difference between... I, I went on uh, on Wikipedia, and I'm reading them and stuff, and I, I really can't find out the difference, in any, if any, the major... Well, there is some, I can tell that, but what is the difference, in your opinion, between the Neon and Kbuntu? Because they both seem like they're YouTube-Buntu-based, and they're both the... KDE proper and all that. So what's the difference between those two operating systems? So for anybody that's, okay. not, that's not following this conversation, Ubuntu or Kubuntu 
is the Ubuntu base operating system with the KDE desktop environment on it. Neon, Project Neon, is the Ubuntu based operating system with the KDE desktop environment. And so her question is, why do you have two of the exact same things with different names? Well, the answer to that question is that they are not exact duplicates. They're very close, but they're not exact duplicates. Neon, what you have to understand about Neon is Neon is not truly a distribution. Neon is really a project that exists to exemplify the features and bells and whistles of the KDE desktop. That's, that's why it exists. So you can almost think of it more as like a demo model. To that end, the Neon model is more up to date. They always are running the most fresh, uh, the most fresh version of the Plasma desktop. Whereas Kubuntu, it's it follows the traditional release cycle. And, uh, you know, later on in the hour, actually very shortly here, we're going to have Simon Quigley, the project lead for the Lubuntu project, who also contributes heavily to uh, Kubuntu. And uh, we can get his opinion on this as well. All right. Thank you much. Yeah, appreciate the call. one 450 noah 855 the email, live at asknoahshow.com. That, that's basically the answer to that question, and that's what the difference is. Um, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, this article from ARS Technica. Headline, Meet Helm, the startup taking on Gmail with a server that runs in your home. There's no doubt Gmail has changed the way that we consume email. It's free, it gives us all of the storage we'd ever need, and it does a better job than most at weeding out spam. But there's a cost to all of this. Storing years' worth of messages in a corporate-owned place gives users less control, and the rightful worry that Google, either being hacked or legally compelled to turn over contents. On Wednesday, a Seattle-based startup called Helm is launching a service designed to make it easy for people to securely take control of their email and other personal data. The company provides a small custom-built server that connects to a user's home or small office network and sends and receives messages, emails, contacts, and calendars. Helm plans to offer photo storage and other services later in the future. With a 120 gigabyte solid-state drive, a three-minute setup, and the ability to store encrypted disk images that can only be decrypted by their customers, Helm says its service provides the ease and reliability of Gmail and its tightly compelled, uh, tightly coupled rather, contacts and calendar services. The startup is betting that people will be willing to pay up to $500 to purchase this box and use it for one year to host some of their most precious assets in their home. The service will then cost $100 per year after that. Included in the fee is the registration and automatic renewal of a unique domain selected by the customer and corresponding TLS certificate from, you guessed it, Let's Encrypt. Quote, I think more and more people are learning that what they get for free is not actually free. Co-founder of CEO Helm told ARS, they are learning that they give up their data and companies like Google and companies like Facebook and others are figuring out anything and everything they can do under the sun to make money with that data and the corresponding online behaviors. This rising awareness is driving people to ask questions like, how do I own my own data and how do I own my online identity? The TLDR to that last question, by the way, is to listen to the Ask Noah Show every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central at AskNoahShow.com because we'll tell you how to own your own data. That's what we do here. We've been doing that for a year, long before Helm became a company. No, on a serious note, the most popular question we get sent into the Ask Noah Show is, how do I host my own email? In fact, I have had people badger me. You do tutorials, I've seen them, you do a very good job, would you be willing to do a tutorial on how to host email? And I, I have always backed away from doing that, I've always shied away from talking about how to host your own email, and it's not because I don't think people should own their own data, it's not because I don't think email is valuable or should be private, I think all of those things. But when it comes to email, the devil is in the details. When it comes to email hosting, the real problem is maintenance. The real problem is managing the system. It's easy to get the system up and running. It's easy for me to put a tutorial on Redmail or Mail in the Box or any number of services that you can just pop up and use and play with, and it will work for a couple of days, but eventually you run into problems. Eventually you run into loads and loads of spam that's coming in, and if you're not a trained mail administrator, that can be problematic. I have a client. And they're a large, large corporation. They have two 
not one but two, count them, full-time male administrators, and they still have problems with their email. Now, I would argue that part of that is the fact that they're hosting it on an exchange server, but what do I know? I'm just the IT contractor. They don't have reliable email with two full-time male administrators, and I hear from people all the time that think they're going to take it on as a part-time hobby at their house, and they're going to manage the email for their entire family. If that's you, you don't understand what you're getting into. Take it from somebody who has managed email for a long time for a lot of people. This service, product, product service, this hybrid, whatever you want to call it, it changes all of that. Because like I said, the problem is in managing the service and managing spam and they're going to their hybrid approach allows you to pay for somebody else to manage the service whilst you keep control of the actual data and it, it is stored at least unencrypted or encrypted unencrypted it is decrypted on your premise the way that this works is that essentially what they have is they have a security gateway that's hosted on Amazon AWS and you buy this box and this box communicates securely as an, through an encrypted VPN tunnel up to this security gateway on, on AWS. So you get the best of both worlds. You have an appliance that is going to host your email service, but you also have a subscription model and a bunch of cloud infrastructure that is going to back you up and is there when you need it. Now, I do, I'm not saying I don't have concerns. I do have concerns. There are some things that I think we need to dig into, and I think there are some things that we need to talk about. For example, the first being, what happens to this appliance if this company goes out of business? Does it become a paperweight? Because the way that they're wording this, the way that it's being described in this article, which we'll have linked at podcast.asknoahshow.com, it seems very likely to me that if you cancel the service, this box becomes nothing more than a glorified paperweight. That's concerning to me. The other thing that is concerning to me is they say that this ongoing $100 fee is to register a domain and keep up with the certificate certifications. Well, first of all, the Let's Encrypt certificate is, let's see here, free. So there's no cost there. There might be an administrative cost to renew it every 30 days, but I can do that myself. In fact, you could set up your box to do that itself. You could just script it to renew the Let's Encrypt certificate. And as far as the domain goes, frankly, I don't want to pay somebody else to manage my domain. If I'm going to host email, I want to use my domain and I want to use the register that I'm already using. I don't need to pay somebody else $100 a year to renew that domain. Altuspeed.com I own for 10 years and I bought that at register for less, as is where I buy all of my domains unless they don't have that top level domain handy in which, uh, available, in which case I buy it at Gandhi. And that's because I like the people that register for less. I think they do a good job. So I'm not interested in paying some other company literally 10 times what I pay register for less to register a domain and have it under their control. What does that model look like if I want to own my domain, if I want to control that? So there seems to be a bit of mis-messaging going on here. I'm not sure quite how to digest that. On the positive side, these people do seem to be taking security seriously. Yes, it involves the cloud. And no, I'm not a huge proponent of the cloud, but I am a proponent of, I, I guess I am a proponent of the cloud when it can supplement local services. What they are doing is they are taking messages that come email messages and they are encrypting it local side on this device that you purchased for $500 in the first year. The first year of service comes with for free. So I suppose you could look at it as this device maybe cost $400 plus the year of service for a hundred bucks. Once that local device encrypts your emails, it then sends the encrypted data back up to the cloud, so back up to this AWS instance. Now, the advantage here is if the local box ever crashes, as long as you back up your security keys, you have the ability to decrypt those messages or resync them back off the cloud, or maybe you, there's a way that you can set it up to distribute. I don't know if they weren't that clear, but if I was designing the system, that's something I would put in. We know for sure that if you back up the keys, you can purchase another hardware device, sync all of your data down, decrypt it, and then you're able to be back in business. So just like we talked with these last couple of callers, backup is a key function, and that is taken away from you. You don't have to worry about backing up this sensitive service. It's being handled above you. Additionally, one of the big things that you struggle with email is having all the appropriate ports opened up on a firewall and many local ISPs will filter traffic on specific ports because as 
if, if you read your agreement with your ISP, you're not supposed to be hosting services. And because of that, they close off ports that you wouldn't need for anything other than, for example, hosting a mail server. These guys get around that by, again, there's this secure VPN tunnel. Your box tunnels out to their security gateway, and that's the, that's the entry point for communicating with the rest of the world. So they make sure that port 25 is open and, and, and uh, 443 and all, all, those, all the various ports that you'd need for email. They deal with all of that on their end. You just worry about this little box. You plug it in. They say it sets up in three minutes, and it, it sets up this encrypted VPN tunnel. That's taking security seriously. That makes me very happy. And it makes me think that there's a real possibility that this is something that AltaSpeed Technologies could set up and deploy. Maybe we even start setting it up for other people. I don't know. They have included a proximity one-time password. So it supports two-factor authentication, but they take it one step further. As the YubiKey does, it requires physical presence to ensure that somebody did not remotely compromise your machine and activate your two-factor authentication token. Helm is doing the exact same thing. They have a proximity one-time password, so it will send a message to your smartphone, but your smartphone must be in close proximity to the Helm physical unit for in order for you to be able to, to elevate your access using the one-time password. Even the firmware updates, I was shocked when I read this. And again, we'll have the article for you at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Even the firmware updates are coming through an encrypted VPN tunnel. These guys, I mean, really, you got to hand it to them, whether you agree with the business model or not, whether you're willing to pay $100 a year or not, whether you're willing to buy this box or not, there is no question about it. If you are looking to host your own email and you want to do it properly, you don't want any of the problems, but you want to own your own data, I can't think of another way to do this. I really can't. This is a really fantastic product, a really great idea. The author of the article, which we're going to have linked for you, he specifically goes out of his way to say, listen, I just don't think that people are going to spend $500 to buy this device and then continue to pay $100 a year for a product and a service that doesn't really have a track record. And, I, you know, I can see his point of view on that. I really can. Because when you start looking at Google, the one thing you know with Google is, yes, it costs you $14 or $12 or whatever G Suite is a month. And yes, they're going to spy on all of your data, but there is absolutely no question in anyone's mind that you're ever going to miss an email, that you're never going to be able to not access your email. And in the case of G Suite support that has more than 15 users in a business organization, that you're not going to be able to talk to a human being and get a problem resolved because Google has nailed it on all of those fronts and, and has, has, a, has, a, has a proven track record of doing an amazing job of hosting emails, which is why some of the world's largest companies, up to and including our friends over at Canonical, use G Suite to manage their email. And that's a big fish to fry. Those are big boots to fill. I'm not saying this company can't do it. I'm just saying that there are, you have to understand that there is years and years of history behind Gmail. And there's a reason that they are the number one mail provider in the United States for company email, because they do such a good job. It also can't be discounted. And not that I think this is a huge deal, but I have seen it play a role in CEO level position decisions to go with G Suite, their ability to control mobile devices. I can, from the Google Suite, uh, G Suite Administrative Council, decide what mobile users can do with their company Google accounts. And CEOs like that kind of control over their business, particularly CEOs who have a business in which their contact information is the prime money maker. So the pharmaceutical company, for example, it's who you know in that business is who you can sell to. So having the right doctor's phone number is everything. And to a lesser extent, you know, law offices and medical offices and stuff like that. Certainly when it comes to technical sales, obviously our contact list is very valuable. And so we take a certain amount of precautions to ensure that the data can't get out. Now, the truth is, I don't worry. I don't sit up and lose sleep over it because the reality is anybody can just take a smartphone and start taking pictures. And the, re and the other reality is, you know where your big clients are. And so to extract that information, it seems like a fruitless effort to try and protect it. But at the same time, there are a lot, I've met a lot of CEOs that appreciate that particular feature of G Suite. 
And so that sort of central control over devices, and now, of course, they're rolling that out to Chromebooks and smart, bo smart boards and uh, meeting rooms and webcams and stuff like that. All of those things, I think, play a role in what makes G Suite so attractive. I also don't see this, this, uh, this helm taking off in the school district, which is another place that you see G Suite really succeeding. A lot of teachers, a lot of school districts, they're saying, hey, we can go the Google route. They'll give it to us for free. They give us Chromebooks for free. They give us the smart boards for free. And this entire infrastructure is just plopped in our lap and we can turn out students that are proficient in Google Docs and Google Sheets. That's something I, I don't really see Helm being able to compete on. But if you are a person that wants to own your own data, this is the way to do it. So we'll have more information linked for you in the show notes. The, the article does a really great job into explaining the nitty gritty technical details of, of uh, how they're making all of this work and the technical advantages to buying this box. I can tell you, I, I'll give it a 95% certainty that I wind up with these in a couple of months and do a review on it, um, mostly because I have a domain that I use for personal stuff that it currently doesn't have email associated with this. This would be a particularly cool fit, and if I'm being honest, $100 a year, that's $10 a month for everything, not just one account, but everything. That beats Fastmail, that beats, that beats G Suite price-wise, e that even beats Zoho. If, if you're going over, you know, whatever the free thing is, five users or whatever it is, it's actually pretty cost, you know, competitive. So we're going to be checking that out. Again, open phones this hour, 1-855-450-NO, that's 855-450-6624, the email live at asknoahshow.com, make your voice heard, become a part of the program. So QT uh, 5.9.7 is released, and of course, you guys for some reason seem to like this Simon guy that uh, hangs out with us over at the Ask Noah Show. So I asked him if he'd join us for a little bit to talk about the latest release of QT. Simon, who's also doing double duty today, is filling in his call screen. And welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, good to be here. So uh, first of all, thank you very much. Obviously, you don't really ever get to take a bow uh, you know, when you're doing call screener, but obviously you're filling in as my family vacations and has a lot of fun. We just kind of hang out and I show up to do the show. And obviously you being the great guy that you are filling his call screener. So I want to thank you for that. But uh, you also have uh, a hand in the forward development of QT. I wouldn't say Qt directly, but um, just in making sure it gets put out to users. So um, in Debian, I'm part of the QtKDE team, which is the team of packagers which um, work on fixes for Qt and also part of the KDE team. And then in Ubuntu specifically, um, I'm in Kubuntu, what we call a Kubuntu ninja, which means I have commit access to the repositories. But mainly, um, I've done a lot of cute maintenance within Ubuntu itself. So um, while I've never sent personally, I've never sent something directly up to Qt. Um, my team members have, and you know we've we've gotten bugs fixed that way. So very cool. So what can we expect with this new release? What is the what are the advantages? Give me the thirty second elevator pitch. So with Qt 5.9.7, um, um, the, the main advantage of upgrading to this release is that it's an LTS release, and these are bug fixes and graphical, um, you know, graphical fixes, um, just in general polish that you wouldn't see um, otherwise. Like if you upgraded from 5.10 to 5.11 or 5.9 to 5.10, you get features rolled in with that. However, if you want a stable system, for example, this is what we use in 18.04. So if you're running, not KDE Neon, because they do their own upgraded Qt stack, but if you're running Kubuntu right now or any one of the Ubuntu flavors and you use a Qt um, application, this is what you're running. So it's for users who want a stable and polished toolkit to run on their system. And in general, like I said, the, the advantage to upgrading this is it is um, the number is 60 fixes, 60 bug fixes, and 180 total changes across wow. most wow. Of the modules. So um, one other thing that I, I think is amazing about this release specifically is the fact that, so Qt just recently started doing 5.6, or, or I'm getting ahead of myself here. They recently started doing LTS releases, and the first LTS release they, they did was 5.6. So the difference between the LTS releases of Qt and the regular releases of Qt are that the LTS releases of Qt are supported for triple the support length. So Qt as a company and, you know, the open source developers, they put bug fixes in the Qt code base for that release 
for three years instead of one year, um, which lines up pretty well with the Ubuntu um, development cycle. So after we get to that three-year period, which the next LTS releases out anyway, um, you know, we stop seeing a lot of these updates. However, this is, it's certainly an advantage to using it. So with the 5.6 release of Q, which like I said, was an LTS release, they only had two different patch versions. So it means two different releases, which only contained bug fixes and um, security fixes. So for example, the, the package that I know always gets security fix it, fixes is Qt Web Engine, which is, it, it bakes in Chromium with it. Um, but it's a cute library that allows you to display web contents along with your application. Um, of course, embedding Chromium in, in your source package, in your um, code, means that you're going to have to follow up with the, cute, with the Chromium fixes that come upstream. So all the security vulnerabilities that are fixed, and believe me, there's a lot of them. I think there's one person at Canonical dedicated to fixing the security vulnerabilities and patching the security vulnerabilities just for the web browser. So it's a big task. Um, that's the that's the one module of Qt that I see always get security fixes. Otherwise, with the couple dozen Qt modules that there are doing things like charts, um, virtual keyboard, just off the top of my head, just like Wayland X11 stuff, as well as there's Android accessories. Among all those modules, it's just mainly bug fixes. So back back to my point, 5.6 only saw two of these patch releases. We're up to with five dot nine dot um, with the five dot nine series. We're up to seven of them, which is, you know, amazing in comparison. Because which with each one of these releases, you would think that at this point that there wouldn't be many changes going into these releases, right? Like when you first release something and you it has a lot of different features, you'd expect that there it might be a little bit rough around the edges. However, we're at the point where we're still fixing things, we're still polishing things, and we're still making it a good experience for the user. So. Yeah, I think the next LTS release they're planning for Qt is 5.9, or actually 5.12. So right now we're up to 5.11 upstream. Um, I'm still, I, I've seen, um, I've seen statements both ways on whether it's going to be regular release or, or an LTS release, but it's definitely something to follow. So. Very much, very much so. Well, thank you very much, Simon. You know, every time we have you on, there's somebody out there that goes, hey, that guy really knows his stuff. I really appreciate him. He's well-spoken. He does a good job at get, get, keeping the community up to date. So, and I, I guess it's not really an announcement, but just kind of something fun we, you know, we'll just say on the air. Um, we're work, working on getting you a studio in um, in your neck of the woods so that you can join us in high quality and, and become more part of the Ask Noah show because we appreciate your contributions. I just want to publicly say thank you uh, for not only your contribution, but also for helping out as call screener tonight. Well, thank you for having me on the show. I really do enjoy this. Yeah, absolutely. one 450 no, it's 855-450, the email, uh, live at asknoahshow.com. So, <laughs> SQLite is making some headlines this week. Having been encouraged by clients to adopt a written code of contact, the SQLite developers elect to govern their interactions with each other, with their clients, and with the larger SQLite user community in accordance with the instruments of good works from Chapter 4 of the Rule of St. Benedict. Uh, it goes, it goes, their site goes on to say, the code of conduct has proven itself for 1,500 years and has served as a baseline for many civil codes. So just to read a little bit of this code of conduct, so that you can get a kind of an idea where this is going. Uh, it starts off, First of all, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Then love your neighbor as yourself. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do you see where they're going with this? Do not covet. Do not bear false witness. Honor all. So on and so forth. You can see where they're going with that, right? So my question to you is this. Do you really want every project to be subject to the worldview of its project maintainers. Because the reason that SQLite is getting a bunch of backlash this week, and they are unequivocally getting a lot of ba backlash this week, is because their code of conduct seemingly represents the worldview of its maintainers. And it seems to force that down the neck, that worldview down the neck of anybody who wants to be a part of that community. And I ask you, is that a good thing? Or is that a bad thing? If the distance between point A to point B is the same as the distance of point B to point A, then that is to say you cannot have it one way and not the other. 
if in this particular case we don't want the worldview of the maintainer to be forced down the necks of anybody that wants to be involved with the project, then we cannot say that when it comes to things like Southeast Linux Fest or the kernel, that the those maintainers can take their worldview and force it down the necks of anybody that wants to contribute. That's that's kind of where I'm at with this. And um, I would argue, and I was having a very long, interesting discussion today with a, a good friend of mine who has a very different world faith view than I have because he's he's a, he's an atheist. Um, and he his response to me was, "I think this is tongue in cheek. I think that th this idea is that nobody is perfect." And he goes on to he goes on to quote. He says. This rule is strict, and none are able to comply perfectly. Grace is readily granted for minor transgressions, and all are encouraged to follow this rule closely, as in doing, they may expect to live happier, healthier, and more productive lives. The entire rule is good and wholesome, and yet we make no enforcement of the introspective aspects. And so he translates that, and I'm quoting him. He says, translated to millennial, nobody is perfect. We all make an error. So let's try to forgive everybody, and let's encourage everybody to do these things so that they have a happier and more fulfilling experience in life. And, uh, he, you know, again, he thinks that this, he thinks that this code of conduct is tongue-in-cheek. It's essentially to... Um, to put the code of conduct in, in a religious context, because there are people that start to treat the code of conduct as if it is dogma or if it is religion. And um, then he says that there are, there's further cheekiness in the fact that it eradicates the line between behavior of the project and outside of the project. And this is something that we have spoken at length with Paul M. Jones about on the air. And quite frankly, we'll probably do again. When does your when does your personal views separate from the project views? When do you have the ability to say, I'm no longer representing the project. I'm on my own Telegram handle. I'm on my own Twitter handle. I'm on my own Facebook account. I'm on my own YouTube channel. When do you have that right to express your own views, agree or disagree? And when are you representing the project? Because there are a lot of people that say that there is no separation, that it's assumed that you're always representing the project. And anytime you act, outside of what the project finds appropriate, then you can be reprimanded because you always are representing the project. Now, again, I'm not necessarily advocating for one side or the other. Obviously, I think all of you know me well enough to know that I have my own views. And I have been very clear with, uh, with a lot of people. I'm not backing down on my views. And I'm not, going to, I'm not going to hide who I am or what I believe. That's just not me. And, um, but at the same time, I want to have a discussion and I want to hear from people that are able to have this discussion and present their views. And part of that is I want to get uh, Richard Hip on the program. Um, I was also told to I was also told to include a quote from Dennis Miller. I could be wrong, but that's just my opinion. Right. And that goes for me, too. I'm not telling you what's right or what's wrong. I'm, and, I, and I said it before on the Linux kernel issue. I don't necessarily know what the right decision for those that contribute code to the Linux kernel is. I don't necessarily know what the right decision for those who contribute to SQLite. I leave that up to that project, and that's for them to figure out, both in both cases. But I want to have the discussion here on the Ask Noah show because I think it applies to a larger community. I think it answers bigger questions. So I reached out to Richard Hip, who I have met and who is a very humble gentleman, a very nice guy who totally underplays the significant role that SQLite has in your life. If you have an Android phone, if you have an iPhone, if you have basically any device, you are using SQLite. And so I reached out to Richard Hip and I said, hey, would you be willing to come on the program and, and do an interview? Now, he couldn't make it tonight for our lifetime. And that brings me to um, what I wanted to talk about, what I talked about, touched on briefly early in the program. We have to solve this problem. We have to solve the problem of there being too much interesting content to fit into a one hour radio show because it's simply not working. There are too many interviews that are getting left out. There is too much content that is not getting that is that is getting left out. I was going to have a another gentleman um, by the name of really join me that was going to talk about how he had interaction with the police because he used Linux on a library computer. It's a fascinating story. It's an interesting story. There's discussion to be had there. There's laughter to be had there, believe me, but we're not going to get time for it tonight. And so that will have to get pushed to another episode. 
And quite frankly, I'm becoming frustrated with the fact that I'm having to push this stuff to, to a next episode because sometimes these stories, sometimes these projects, sometimes this content is time specific and we don't get to it. And that is frustrating to me, specific, particularly because we have invested I'm not kidding, tens of thousands of dollars into broadcasting infrastructure. And most recently, we invested thousands and thousands of dollars into our online streaming system so that we can have the best sounding audio stream on the internet at asknoahshow.com. So what we're going to do, because we're not getting these guests on, because there are projects we're not covering, because there are things that we are doing at Speed Technologies, like this WISP project that we just didn't get a chance to talk to, there's stuff going on in the mobile world. I want to get some of the people on from Arco Linux because they are doing some really cool things. And yet I still want to make time for the callers because as always, the callers come first. What we're going to do is we are going to expand the show. We're going to do it just for the next week or so just to see how things go, how I can make it jive with my schedule. But I am willing to take the show and make it a higher priority if you, the listener, are willing to download the show, participate in the show, give feedback on the show. If you do those things... I am more than happy to put the first foot forward. So here's what the next, the rest of the the next couple week, or next week or so is going to look like. Today is October 23rd. That's when we're recording this episode of the Ask Noah Show. It will come out tonight as usual. On October 26th, that will be this Friday, we will have a special edition of the Ask Noah Show. We're going to have Richard Hip on, and we're going to talk to him in more detail about his decision um, to include this this very controversial code of conduct, how long it's been out, and what the response of the community has been lately. October 27th, that's the Saturday following this coming Friday, we're going to have another special edition. I won't tell you what's coming up on the rest of these, I don't want to spoil it, but there'll be another special edition episode of the Ask Noah Show on October 27th, the Saturday. The next week will be October 30th. That's our normal recording time. That's Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central at asknoahshow.com. We're going to have our regular episode. You can call in, ask questions. The phone lines will be open for all of these episodes, but obviously we're going to prioritize phone calls on the Tuesday episodes because that's the days you know to be here. We're not necessarily planning on phone calls on these other dates. Then the, the next week is going to be crazy. We're going to do a show November 2nd, November 3rd, November 4th, November 5th, and November 6th. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, that's five days in a row. On November 6th, we're going to record the episode earlier in the day. We'll publish it at our normal time. But that Tuesday, November 6th, is going to be election night here in the United States where we're having our midterm elections. Now, our friend from the, the Schmidt Show, Brad Schmidt, and I are going to be out at, a, at an on-site location here in Grand Forks covering the election. So if you want to get involved and learn about American politics or get up to date on all of the elections around the country, head over to electioncoverage.vote election coverage dot vote and brad and i will get that kicked off around i would guess around five maybe six p.m somewhere in there as the election starts rolling and we're going to go until the election is over anybody that's in the grand forks or surrounding communities you're welcome to join us we'll have an exact time and place planned in the next week or so we'll announce that and have that available to you, you can come out and hang out with us and it's going to be a lot of fun so we're going to do that so ask noah show earlier that day then election coverage later that night if politics aren't your thing don't worry we'll still have an ask noah show for you i just can't have it at 6 p.m the exact same time because that'll be right in the middle of our election coverage and then the very next day november 7th that's a wednesday we're going to celebrate the 100th edition of the ask noah show the 100th episode of the ask noah show we're going to do that in minneapolis st paul at the tamarack tack room um, probably tentatively scheduled for 6 p.m. that night, and Brandon Johnson from Red Hat is going to be joining us. So make sure to make that. If you can't make the Grand Forks election coverage and you still want to come out and hang out with us, by the way, I think Brad now probably buy you some food for the first couple people that show up on Tuesday. So if you want to do that, make sure to take advantage of it. But if not, come to the Tamarack Tap Room on November 7th at around 6 p.m. Again, final details to be finalized, but that's tentatively the plan. We're going to have some folks from Red Hat there, um, and it's going to be a fun time as we celebrate the 100th uh, episode of the Ask Noah Show. We're going to have a large poster uh, commemorating the 100th episode. We're going to have everybody that's there sign it. Obviously, I will buy, uh, I'll pick up the, the food tab and stuff like that. The last time we did this, it was a huge success. I think you can ask anybody that was there and they would tell you that they had a good time. So that's kind of what we're looking at. I know it's a lot coming up. I know there's a lot happening here, but I'm hoping that this is what you guys want because I know I want to take this show to the next level. And this is the way that I know how to do that is to put more of more effort, more time, more energy into the show. 
Did you know this episode is available as a downloadable podcast? To subscribe to the feed or download the latest episode, visit podcast.asknoahshow. And, of course, you can get the latest episode there. You can follow us on Twitter, which will be very important over the next couple of weeks because that's where we're going to publish the schedule. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.